Good morning, everybody. It's Chapter 35, Real Property and Landlord-Tenant Law. In this chapter, we're going to explore the nature of real property. We're also going to explore ownership interests and leases. We'll explore transfer of ownership. And finally, we'll examine landlord-tenant relationships. Here are the learning objectives that are listed in the chapter, with which I am not certain that I agree as to the priority that they should be given. Uh, what is a fixture and how does it relate to real property rights? All right, that's relatively important. What is the difference between a joint tenancy and a tenancy in common? I'm not convinced that that's really the right question. Uh, what are the requirements for acquiring property by adverse possession? That's so rare that I think it could be safely left to a later class. What are the duties of the landlord and the tenant with respect to the use and maintenance of leased property? Okay, that might have something to do with your real life. So let's start this exploration of what, at least in law school, is either a three or a six hour course, depending upon where you are and where you're taking it. A real property consists of land and the buildings, plants and trees that are on it. Um, real property by its nature is considered to be indestructible, although Again, that isn't strictly speaking true. Um, it is not just the surface, but all things from the bowels of hell to the heavens above. At least that's the traditional common law view of land ownership. Uh, that way property owners have rights both to airspace, uh, theoretically of, of infinite projection um, and to the soil and minerals beneath it as far down as uh, the core of the earth. In reality, of course, technology has limited the amount of um, core drilling that we can do from our property and airspace rights above a certain height uh, have been, some people feel usurped, but others just feel, you know, this is something governments do, um, and, and are held in common use, which is why uh, airlines don't have to uh, apply for a license to fly over all the private property that exists in the world. Um, in large cities, for example, people will sell air rights uh, that they do own down at a much lower height. Uh, so you'll find certain parts of New York City, for example, um, go to, I want to say it's uh, Penn Station. Uh, they sold off the air rights above the original structure so that there's a sort of cantilevered skyscraper above uh, Penn Station. Um, and a lot of other cities, similar things have happened where there are um, much smaller pre-elevator uh, structures that have done the same thing in terms of selling off the airspace rights above the buildings to uh, later developers. Subsurface rights, including not just mineral rights, but out west in particular, both uh, surface and subsurface water rights um, are also very important and separate, generally held to be certainly severable from the, the land itself. So um, that includes, uh, even here in Florida, it includes people 
selling the right to minerals underneath their land, selling the right to uh, drill for um, minerals or for uh, petrochemicals, um, fracking, all of these things are rights that you can give up. Uh, when you do that, you give up more than simply the uh, subsurface property. Um, in some areas where they have hard mining, uh, you can in fact sell your mineral rights without necessarily giving access to the mineral rights to folks that are then going to be mining them. Uh, but in other places, uh, you have to also give the ability to the person who has purchased your mineral rights uh, to actually get to access them. So. If you are selling your, your oil rights, uh, you have to allow somebody the space to drill and to maintain a pump once they've actually found it. So you're giving up a lot more than you might think, depending upon just the exact nature of what it is that you're selling in the way of uh, subsurface or mineral rights. Plant life and vegetation, uh, you may recall, uh, we didn't go into a lot of detail with it uh, in the UCC portion of this course. Uh, probably would have gone into more detail with it had we not had such an unusual semester. But um, crops can become identified to a goods contract um, once they've actually been planted and they're growing. So even though they may be considered to be real property because they're currently growing on the real property, uh, their cultivated plant life, they nonetheless have a substantially goods nature uh, which can serve as the basis of having an insurable interest in those growing crops, um, as well as being something that can be serve as a kind of collateral for loans uh, as growing crops. So even though they haven't been separated and are real property because they ultimately will be separable, um, they're considered to have certain aspects of, of goods at the same time. Fixtures are sort of the opposite of growing crops that way. Fixtures are goods which, once they become more or less permanently attached to real property, then become part of the real property. So if you own a house, uh, the house itself sitting uh, on the property is part of the real property, but it's not a fixture. Uh, the things inside the house, like uh, ceiling fans, um, built-in appliances, um, those are fixtures and would be considered to be part of the real property. So that uh, when you sold your house and moved away from it in the absence of any other agreement, uh, you would be expected not to tear the uh, ceiling fans out and take them with you since ordinarily they would have been considered part of the real property and sold along with the house. Okay, this description of ownership interests, at least the first one, I think is a little bit deceptive. Uh, it says, ownership in fee simple. An owner in fee simple is entitled to use, possess, or dispose of the property as he or she wishes, chooses, during his or her lifetime. That almost sounds like this person only has a life estate. Their rights uh, would terminate upon their death. No, uh, fee simple ownership is not the same as a life estate. Uh, its duration is, is indefinite. So for example, if a corporation which has an unlimited life owns a piece of property in fee simple, or what we usually call fee simple absolute, um, the duration is going to be for the existence of that corporation or until the property is disposed of. So literally the duration of a fee simple ownership interest 
can be forever, assuming that the entity that owns it also has an unlimited life. Um, limitations on use concerning uh, fee simple absolute property uh, are largely going to be limited only by um, um, what society brings about as a limitation of use. So there will be zoning requirements that will have to be followed. Uh, but short of governmental and, and, and societal limitations like that, uh, you're theoretically free to do just about anything that you want to do with property that you own uh, in Fee Simple. Now we're presented with the concept of the life estate in real property. That's an interest in land that exists only for the duration of the life of a specified individual who is usually the holder of the estate. Um, a lot of people, it's an element of estate planning, and this goes back a long, long time, will give the remainder interest in property, that is the interest that uh, will ripen into ownership uh, following the specified event, in this case, their death. Uh, the remainder interest in property they'll give, say, to their children, although it would, certainly doesn't have to be their children or their spouse, although it doesn't have to be that either. Uh, it can be anyone or anything, um, PBS, will urge you to give a remainder interest in your house, say, to PBS as a charitable donation uh, and retain a life estate, which gives you the um, right not just to live there, but the right to do whatever you wish with property during your life. Uh, what it, it does have a limitation that fee simple ownership doesn't have, however, you're not allowed to waste the property and you are obliged to maintain the property. So um, the remainderman can um, become upset with you if you say don't repair roof uh, or any other of the structural components of a piece of property. Uh, they have a right to make sure that you keep the property insured against loss um, so that they still have something as a remainder interest. They have the right to make sure that you um, pay the taxes on the property. If you don't pay the taxes, uh, remainder men have the right to pay the taxes and to sue you in order to get the money for the taxes back out of you as a wasteful life estate holder. Um, conveyance. Word conveyance just simply means transferring the property, transferring the title of the real property from one person to another by a deed or another document. It doesn't have to be a sale, it can be a gift. Um, obviously, there are also uh, transfers that you can make that uh, have more legal substance to them than uh, real economic substance, such as when uh, a person uh, creates a trust with themselves as the trustee and they convey property out of their individual name over to the trustee to hold it for the benefit of themselves. Uh, there are legal reasons why a person might want to do that, obviously, um, in order to offer certain protections of the property from claims of creditors, say, um, but that is also a conveyance. Okay, concurrent ownership. If you say concurrent ownership, I say joint ownership. Uh, I say tomato and you say tomato. Uh, there's no difference between the phrase concurrent ownership and joint ownership in terms of what we're talking about. A tenancy in common, which is usually what you'll see uh, being described as the way uh, two or more n named individuals who are on a deed um, holding title to a piece of real estate will be referenced uh, unless they're married to each other. 
A tenancy in common is joint ownership of the property. Each property owns an undivided interest, which means that they're free to use the entirety of the property, um, not, you know, not a prorated share of the property, but every person who has the ownership interest has an equal right to use all of the property. So if you have 12 tenants in common, um, each one of the 12 can use 100% of the property all the time. This can cause problems, obviously. Uh, that interest also passes on to their heirs. Um, one of the problems with folks under certain state law schemes who did not have wills in order to pass their property to others uh, over a course of several generations, uh, you can wind up with ownership being very, very fragmented in, in real property. And this is, is frequently a problem in uh, rural parts of America, especially rural sections in the South where the, um, where the yeoman farmers were not necessarily uh, either sophisticated or uh, wealthy enough to have necessarily made the appropriate um, succession planning choices prior to their deaths. Um, so if you have a joint tenancy, a tenancy in common, either one, uh, and one person is unhappy with it, is there a way they can get out of it? Well, yes, they can go to the court and they can sue um, for a partitioning of the property. Um, generally speaking, when you file a, a petition for partition of the property, the court is going to do everything that it can in order to convince you to come to some amiable, uh, equitable solution and get bought out by the parties who want to remain in the tenancy because it's an expensive procedure. Uh, attorney's fees get paid off the top and you usually don't get the best price in the world when you have a court ordered um, partition of a property in order to make sure that each one of the, the heirs is getting their percentage out of it. A joint ownership of property um, that has a right of survivorship uh, guarantees that at the time that one party dies, the remaining uh, tenants, wh whether it's one or more than one, are going to be the per people who inherit or re inherit it by operation of law or receive by operation of law the interests of the person who's died. So um, if you have two people, and you have a joint tenancy with a right of survivorship. And that's usually how it's phrased, because obviously it's it's not a tenancy in common. If one of them dies, the other one will automatically then own all of the property. Uh, so it's just simply a matter of seeing who dies first. Uh, and that's I mean that's the traditional way that you terminate a joint tenancy uh, that has a right of survivorship. The other way, as I just discussed, was by going to the court and asking for a partition. In a large part of the country, particularly in the eastern United States, and definitely Florida, um, and up and down the eastern seaboard, uh, North Carolina is another big tenancy by the entirety state. Tenancy by the entireties means that a married couple, uh, ordinarily just listed on a deed as husband and wife, have taken the property as joint tenants with a right of survivorship and certain other legal impacts beyond simply a right of survivorship. Tenancy by the entireties is its own legal doctrine. Um, neither spouse can transfer his or her interest in the property without the consent of the other. Uh, that includes things like, um, uh, when we say alienating property, it includes signing a mortgage. So I um, just received a um, um, notice from the uh, first district court of appeals on a case that uh, I had where my client was a widow 
and she had not signed the mortgage that her husband, now deceased, had signed uh, prior to his death. And so she was asserting that uh, she had not alienated uh, her property rights. And, and we prevailed there because she had not alienated her property rights. Um, community property is um, mainly in Western states. I think the easternmost states uh, that recognizes community property is Wisconsin. Um, states that recognize community property, uh, by and large, do not recognize tenancy by the entireties. So uh, community property is essentially um, the equal division of all property that is acquired during the term of the marriage, um, which is not the same concept that we have uh, in the eastern part of the United States. A leasehold is essentially a rental agreement an interest in real property that gives a tenant a qualified right to possess and or use the property for a limited time under a lease. Leases obviously can be residential, they can be commercial, they can be long-term, they can be short-term, um, they can be um, of unspecified length if, for example, they're uh, entered into on a month-to-month -month basis or entered into as a fixed term, uh, say it's six months or a year typically, uh, and providing for a continuation as a month-to-month -month lease. So at least it's entered into uh, for um, periods such as week to week, month to month, or year to year, is referred to as a periodic tenancy. Uh, residential leases, at least in the state of Florida, typically will not be entered into on a month to month or shorter basis because any lease for residence that's shorter than six months is uh, subject to sales tax while any residential lease that's longer than six months is not subject to sales tax. Accordingly, very few landlords are going to enter into a initially month-to-month -month lease. Now, they may enter into a lease that after its initial term of a year, say, will become month-to-month. -month. That's okay. That, that doesn't make it subject to sales tax thereafter. Um, but there is a strong desire among residential landlords, at least, to avoid having to pay and collect uh, sales tax from their tenants. Uh, that's not true in the, in the commercial context. Um, in the commercial context, it's always going to be taxable. Tenancy at will is a type of tenancy that either the landlord or the tenant can terminate without any notice. Uh, generally speaking, again, most of these um, uh, term tenancies, uh, whether they're for a year or some other period, after the expiration of the initial term will become a tenancy at will. Um, if it specific, specifically says month to month, then you do have to give notice. You have to give notice at the middle of the month, at least in this state. Um, so a true tenancy at will, which is simply walking away from the property um, without any additional liability is relatively unusual. Uh, tenancy at sufferance, uh, this is what we call it when somebody just won't go. And until you get around to getting them off of the property, um, you're suffering their presence on the property. And I'm sure every single one of you will recall that we have talked about easements before. The right of a person to make a limited use of another person's real property without taking anything from the property. And specifically, 
We talked about um, easements uh, for ingress and egress from property uh, and how if you were to deed over a piece of property that uh, you owned that used to have access to a road but now didn't because you were severing it from the part of the property that was on the road, you would have to give people an easement in order to get to the road uh, or they could go to the court and, and, and force you to do it. Uh, and how typically there are easements for particular purposes, whether it's for utilities or for some other reason. Um, profits. In real property law, the right to enter onto somebody's property and remove something of value from the property. So, example, if you have um, surrendered your mineral rights to the property, you have to give the people access in order to get to the minerals, in order to um, um, profit from it. So you have to give them an easement in order to do that. And the easement may you know, even include uh, uh, you know, a wellhead or, or a mining structure. Um, but that is something that by virtue of having given them the right to, to profit from the property and the way that you've given it to them, you have to also allow them to do this as well. And that, that, would, that would apply if you had, uh, if you were leasing property in order to uh, um, say as pasturage, uh, that would carry with it the right to, um, for that person to have an easement in order to build fences, uh, since otherwise their right would be sort of worthless. Now, easements are permanent. Licenses are not. So if you want to license your property to somebody to grow crops on it, for example, uh, for the next five years, um, fine. That You're not giving them an easement. You're giving them a license because it's uh, a, a limited, limited in time. Another handy chart, interest in real property. Ownership interest, fee simple, the most complete form of ownership. A life estate, an estate that lasts for the life of a specified individual. Concurrent ownership, ownership by two or more persons who hold title to property together. Types of concurrent ownership are as follows. Tenancy in common, joint tenancy, tenancy by the entirety, and community property. Leasehold estates, there's a fixed term tenancy, which is, or a tenancy for years, uh, periodic tenancy, ordinarily month to month, week to week, tenancy at will, which is, hey, you know, uh, anybody can you know, cut it off at any time. I can walk over and say, get out, or you can just leave. And a tenancy at sufferance, which is, you're already in the bad because your, your tenancy is already over but I haven't gotten around to throwing you off the property yet. Non-possessory interests include easements, profits, and licenses. Okay, in the case of um, real estate sales contracts, in a lot of states there is, and in a growing number of states, there is now what is referred to as an implied warranty of habitability. And sometimes this is accompanied by or substitutes for a requirement by local um, inspection authorities to provide something called a certificate of occupancy. Uh, implied warranty of habitability basically says if it's a new house, it's going to be fit for human habitation or the implied promise by a landlord that a rented residential premises are habitable. Uh, if you're selling property, and we have talked about this before too, you have a duty to disclose hidden defects. Uh, certainly that would be the hidden defects that you're aware of or that you should have um, with the exercise of due diligence been aware of.
deeds are documents by which title to real property is passed. So, in order to be valid as a deed, in order to actually convey property in uh, real estate, uh, you have to have the names of the grantor and the grantee, or the typically the seller and the the buyer, but not you know, or the he who gives and he who gets. Words evidencing the intent to convey the property. Um, in the past, there used to be something medieval times called livery of season whereby in order to convey the property, you actually had to literally go and pick up a clod of dirt from the property and press it into the new owner's hands. Uh, that's no longer required. We can do it all with words. You have to have a legally sufficient description of the land and ordinarily in places that uh, utilize a plat system, which most counties do, um, Surveyors will have gone out, created uh, platted subdivisions, and reference can then be made by the block and plot and, and lot number in the plat in order to be a legally sufficient description of the land. Uh, in a lot of places for rural descriptions where it has not been, the property has not been planted, uh, the descriptions are made based upon uh, uh, government surveys. Um, so that they will describe a certain, a certain range and a certain, um, um, you know, acreage within that range. Uh, there has to be a grantor signature on the deed. Uh, you have to deliver the deed. That, that's rather, <clears throat> rather than plus pressing a, a clod of dirt in somebody's hand, there does have to be physical delivery of the deed. And in order to accomplish um, the deed being valid as against third parties, uh, you, it also has to be recordable. And it has to be recordable in the place of, of the county where the land is located that is set up for recording, um, which is ordinarily maintained by, by county officials. Um, most places are gonna require that you have uh, two witnesses uh, and that the deed be notarized in order to be recordable because a deed that isn't recordable uh, is really not going to be acceptable for uh, title insurance purposes. And that is that is probably more important than whether or not the deed is, is, is just facially valid or not, is so whether or not you can get title insurance based on that deed. So what's the best kind of deed you can get? What's the kind of deed that you're gonna want if you're purchasing property? It is a warranty deed. Uh, this is a deed that provides the greatest amount of protection for, by the, for the grantee. Uh, again, uh, it's only gonna be as good as uh, the seller is in terms of not being judgment proof after you've purchased the property, but the seller is coveting and guaranteeing to you that they had title to the property, that they had the power to convey the property to you, um, that you're going to be able to enjoy the property quietly so that there are no um, strangers who are going to come around and claim that they've got ownership in it uh, that is inconsistent with your ownership. Uh, there's a covenant that the transfer is made without knowledge of any adverse claims of third parties. And essentially, the seller is going to step up to the plate and is going to uh, guarantee and indemnify you if any of these bad things happen. But not every seller is going to be willing to give you a uh, warranty deed. There are also what are known as special warranty deeds where essentially the seller is only going to guarantee that um, he or she didn't do anything while they owned the property that would have created any of those potential problems that we were just talking about. 
they don't warrant that there are no defects in title from prior owners uh, that might come back and 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 bite you. Um, quick claim deeds are the weakest of deeds because all that they do is convey whatever interest it is that the grantor has and nothing else. So um, if I were to quick claim to you um, all of my right title and interests in the Brooklyn Bridge, um, that'd be a valid deed because it would convey nothing to you because I have no interest whatsoever in the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, but it'd be a valid quick claim deed. And presumably if it were set up sort of recordable, you could record it. Um, but if I were to actually receive any consideration for you on a, on a deal where I'm quick claiming you my interest in the Brooklyn Bridge, it would no doubt be a fraudulent conveyance. Um, but that's okay. Uh, recording statutes. These are the statutes that allow the deeds, the mortgages, other real property transactions to be recorded. So it's provide notice of future purchasers or creditors of an existing claim on the property. And that is what is crucial. Because without recording the deeds, the deeds are essentially worthless. Because if nobody knows that the deed exists and that you're claiming an interest in the property and that they can go to a centralized place and look and see who is who the people are who claim interest in the property, the world has no way of knowing. And in the absence of knowing, um, you know, there is no certainty. And if there's no certainty, business suffers. And we don't want that. All right, this is a trifle oversimplistic. Property that is transferred on an owner's death is passed either by will or by state inheritance laws. Yeah, sort of. Um, if the owner of land dies with a will, the land passes in accordance with the terms of the will. Well, maybe, it depends. Uh, if the owner dies without a will, state inheritance statutes prescribe how and to whom the property will pass. Again, maybe sort of. We got to take into consideration several things here. First of all, whether or not the property is owned um, in fee absolute. So if it's owned in fee absolute, then we also had to consider at least in most states, whether or not the property is homestead. And every state has a different homestead law. Most of them are enshrined in the state constitutions. Some of them are considerably more um, restrictive on property transfers at death than others are. Florida has a very restrictive homestead law. It protects property from claims of creditors uh, in a much more comprehensive way than most states do, but by the same token, it severely limits to whom a, um, a, a decedent can leave their property. So the Florida Constitution literally will supersede a will under a lot of circumstances. Um, a person is allowed to leave their homestead to their surviving spouse. Um, there are severe other limitations. Uh, you're certainly, if, um, if a person is survived by a, a spouse and minor children and they attempt to leave their homestead to anyone else, uh, that, that conveyance is not going to take place. It's, it's going to be ineffective. Uh, that that part of the will is going to be void because uh, under circumstances where you have a surviving spouse and surviving children, they must become the um, uh, the parties who receive the homestead. Uh, the wife receiving the uh, right to the to use the property for her life, and then the children receiving remainder interest in the property. Um, it's far more complicated than we can get into in this survey course, but 
to simply say that uh, owners have the right to leave property by will, uh, and if they don't, that uh, state inheritance laws will, will cover it, is, is a gross understatement, particularly when most people, um, if they own any real property at all, the only thing that they do own is their homestead. Now, this is further complicated by the fact that in this state, um, we also have tenancy by the entireties. So upon, um, if the property is held as tenants by the entireties, um, the husband and wife, that aspect of it is going to trump uh, the homestead law. So uh, husband and wife and property is tenancy by the entireties. Uh, the wife dies. Uh, the husband will automatically um, uh, receive title to the property uh, in fee simple absolute by operation of law, um, notwithstanding the fact that the husband might have minor children uh, by that same marriage uh, where the wife has just died. Uh, so homestead would only kick in under that circumstance if the wife happened to own the house in her name alone. Then the property would be homestead. The wife would not have been able to have left it to somebody else. And the husband and the minor children would have then received it the way I described previously. So yes, if you've got questions regarding homestead or questions regarding how you're going to effectively convey a residence uh, upon death, at least in this state, uh, it would certainly help if you consulted a lawyer. Now, as I said before, I really think that uh, Miller is uh, overemphasizing the impact of adverse possession in a modern era. Um, yeah, in theory, you can obtain title to land without delivery of a deed and without the consent of or payment to the true owner. But the requirements are uh, severe. Possession has to be actual and exclusive. So somebody literally can't just come in and squat. Um, or, I mean, they've got to say they own the property. They have to be open, visible, and notorious. You can't, you know, stick up a fence out in the middle of uh, the woods and say, I'm, I'm now in adverse possession of this uh, half acre in the middle of a 640 acre tract that nobody ever visits and so they don't know that I'm here. Uh, possession must be continuous and peaceable for the required period of time. The required period of time, depending upon the jurisdiction, um, but if it's without color of title, and that's important, um, if it's without color of title and just simply based on being open and visible and notorious, it's it's typically at, at least 14 years uh, or longer, and some places 20, and some places as long as 30 years. So um, it takes an enormous length of time in order to uh, uh, recover, or I should say, steal property by adverse possession. Now, under color of title, the period of time is generally speaking a lot shorter. Uh, it can be as short as seven years. Uh, under color of title just means that uh, you at least have something that is like a quick claim deed that says that you own the property and it's been recorded. So it looks as though uh, title could be in, in fact in your name. Uh, the possession also has to be hostile and adverse, which means that the real owner uh, has to essentially be in a position where they can be aware of it and that if they attempt to come and tell you to get off of their property, um, I don't know, I guess you're standing there with a shotgun uh, telling them to, you know, get off their land. <laughs> and again, I don't think the circumstances under which you're going to have um, adverse possession issues are going to be terribly uh, common uh, or, or necessarily very important from the uh, business point of view uh, as you go through life. Eminent domain, on the other hand, can in fact be extremely important since 
This is the power of the government to take land from private citizens for public use on the payment of just compensation. And as you'll recall, way back at the very beginning of this course, we discussed the fact that um, eminent domain and the right to compensation is guaranteed under the Bill of Rights of the Constitution of the United States. So what happens in eminent domain? Well, first, the government or some agency acting um, under the color of the government is going to declare the need, the public need, for this private land um, or the rights of the private land. Um, some entities, such as canal companies, um, 200 years ago, railroads 150 years ago and down to now uh, might also have the right to eminent domain to go in and exercise on behalf of, uh, of private, in private interests. Um, some cities have done the same thing. They exercise the right of, private, of eminent domain in order to um, turn around and have a development of a project by declaring that the property is needed in a public sense, even though ultimately it's going to be used put to private purposes. Um, more commonly, you have highway departments uh, exercising rights of eminent domain uh, everywhere uh, in order to um, provide for public right-of-ways. Um, it's a process. In this state, it can be highly lucrative to both the property owner and to the attorneys representing the property owner uh, because attorney's fees are guaranteed. Uh, there's essentially no incentive whatsoever for taking the first offer that's being made to you by the government on, on, the, on the taking. Um, there is a, obviously, uh, due process requirements exist. So after notice, you have a uh, process with administrative hearings. Uh, you have a right to bring in experts in order to establish the value, not just of the property, but if you have a business on the property, the value of the business. Uh, you're entitled to receive compensation for relocation expenses in addition to, to uh, the actual value of the property, if you happen to be, if it happens to be commercial use property. Um, it's it's can be a considerable expense to a government in order to take property using the power of eminent domain. Um, but this is to give you an example. I mean, the reason why so little of the um, southern border wall has in fact actually been constructed is that the good citizens of Texas, in particular, who live along the border. Um, don't really want to give up their land in order to have a wall built. And in consequence of that, uh, rather than agreeing with the government to, uh, uh, to its use of the power of eminent domain, they are insisting upon exercising their rights. And thus the process is taking uh, years in order to get to the point where um, just compensation is being paid to these folks, and the land is actually finally being taken. Landlord-tenant relationships. Landlord-tenant relationships are established by a lease contract. In most states, statutes require leases for terms exceeding one year to be in writing. Now, why would that be? I would say that in any state that recognizes the statute of frauds, and you'll recall that the statute of frauds requires that any executory contract that cannot, by its terms, be fulfilled within the term of one year has to be in writing. So if you had a lease that is for longer than one year, can it be fulfilled within one year? No, 
So it's simple. The statute of frauds is going to require that any lease succeeding a year has to be in writing. Now, in addition, there is a requirement under the statute of frauds that uh, any contract concerning an estate in real estate also has to be in writing. So if that's the case, if you're writing a um, rental agreement or a lease for any term whatsoever, then arguably the statute of frauds requires that that be in writing as well. So what do you got? Rights and duties under a lease. The tenant is given the right in exchange for the payment of rent to possession of the premises and is entitled to quiet enjoyment of the premises, meaning that the landlord can't come around knocking on the door and saying, I want to see what's going on in here, <laughs> unless they've got a good reason. Um, and it really ought to be a very good reason uh, to interfere with the quiet enjoyment of the premises by the, by, by the tenant. Um, when the tenant doesn't pay you, you do have the right to evict or if the tenant violates other aspects of the lease, so you got a lease that says that uh, there's no smoking, and yet you got a tenant who insists upon smoking tobacco or some other substance, um, you have the right as a landlord to terminate their tenancy uh, for a violation of, of, a, of a condition of the lease. Typically, um, there's going to be a landlord tenant law state by state by state, and there's going to be a requirement for notice if you're going to evict either for failure to pay or for a violation of the lease terms. Uh, in this state, you have to give at least three days notice prior to uh, an eviction for not paying. Uh, these are special circumstances uh, this month and in the next couple of months, I would say, uh, due to either the CARES Act or to local ordinances and local statutes or to declarations by governors and mayors uh, that are going to slow down or prevent evictions for at least a short period of time on the basis of not paying rent. Now, as to other violations of the leases, that's, a, that's an open question. Couldn't tell you. Typically, again, here in Florida, generally speaking, uh, you got to give seven days notice, uh, right to cure before you can file for an eviction for that kind of violation. Um, but again, you know, in the very short run, who knows? Leases can shuffle off at least a little bit of the maintenance of the premises onto the tenants. Um, that's especially true in commercial leases. In residential leases, though, depends on the circumstances. I've seen leases where the landlord attempts to force the tenants to take care of maintenance, maintenance issues that really go to whether or not the place is even habitable. Um, so. You know, you can try to require that the tenant uh, fix any appliances that break or you know, repair the heating and air conditioning if it breaks or <laughs> repair the hot water heater. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think that there are good arguments to be made that landlords have to be responsible for these things that are that are fixtures that are that are literally, you know, already part of of uh, of the structure. Um, and you can't get out of having, you know, the obligation to maintain the premises simply because somebody is, is failing to pay rent. Uh, likewise, if a landlord isn't maintaining it in a way that you like, that doesn't for you as a, as a tenant of the right to, to pay rent. Although there are circumstances where you can go and, and make a deposit of rent into a court registry and, and, you know, deal with the issues that way. Uh, commercial lease terms tend to be extremely uh, one-sided in terms of requiring tenants to take care of just about everything. Um, you know, it's just not likely to have a landlord who's going to be responsible for much under a commercial lease. And finally, 
um, most leases are not going to allow any any subletting. Uh, if it does, if, if you're allowed to have a sublease, uh, which is a tenant's transfer of all or part of the lease premises to a third person for a period shorter than the lease term, it's ordinarily going to be uh, only with the landlord's approval. Uh, but there's typically going to be a requirement that uh, the landlord cannot unreasonably withhold their approval. But if you've got somebody, even if you're allowing subletting, um, and that person was only originally allowed to, as, as a tenant uh, because they had a good credit history, for example, um, you don't have to allow a subletting to somebody with a rotten credit history. I mean, it, yeah only stands to reason. Termination of the lease. A lease usually terminates when its term ends. Other ways to terminate a lease include tenant purchase of the leased property or tenant abandonment. Um, yeah, that's all true. So um, this is the end of the April 13th lecture. Thank you very much. Make sure that you turn in your quizzes by noon. Thank you.